So, um, good afternoon. Uh, my name, good afternoon, Mocha friends. My name is Niwo Gibbs, Chief of Staff at the Museum of Chinese in America. So we hope you all and your families are remaining safe and healthy during these challenging times. Thank you very much for joining us virtually today as curator and museum director, Michelle Yu Mabel Therup talks about her life and work with Herb Tang, Mocha Curator and Director of Exhibitions. This conversation is part of the series Curators in Conversation, where we learn about how curators, artists, and cultural producers in the Chinese and Asian American communities approach their work. Michelle will discuss her upbringing, early interest in art, her passion for modern and contemporary Asian art, museum leadership, and recent projects, including Asia Society's inaugural triennial, We Do No Dream Along, the first initiative of its kind in the United, in the United States that focuses on contemporary art from and about Asia and the diaspora. Featuring more than 40 artists working across disciplines from more than 20 countries. The ongoing pandemic has impacted every aspect of life for people from around the world. For many Asian American Pacific Islanders, hate against AEPIs is on the rise again. At this heartbreaking moment in our country's history, Mocha as a social history museum remains committed to documenting immigrant stories, raising awareness about the long history of anti-Asian racism and offering spaces for discussion and reflection. Please read Mocha's full statement and the list of resources in response to racism against AEPIs at www.mocha.nyc.org slash hyphen involved slash racism hyphen response. Please also feel free to watch a video created by Mocha charting the historical roots of anti-Asian racism in America from 1882 to now on our YouTube channel. Mocha also recently launched a Remember, Record, Respect campaign for us to continue accepting your stories, letters, emails, texts, videos, recordings, reflections, conversations, photos, social media posts, art, poetry, or sounds created in response to anti-AAPI violence. Email one word at mocha.nyc.org so that we can add your stories, videos, or art to the Mocha One World COVID-19 Special Collection to be considered for an upcoming exhibition at Mocha. If you enjoy this public program, we hope you will consider making a gift to become part of a continuing lifeline for Mocha. No amount is too little, and we greatly appreciate your generosity. Your contributions help sustain our beloved institution and support the creation of new online programming that will bring comfort and inspiration to more communities. This program is brought to you by Mocha friends and partners, including Bloomberg Philanthropies. It is also supported in part by public funds from the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs in partnership with the City Council. Without further ado, I will let our moderator, Herb, to introduce our guest speaker, Michelle. Thank you very much. Thank you, Neil, for that um, introduction and uh, welcome everybody. Good afternoon. Uh, great to be here with you um, for this uh, edition of Curators in Conversation, a series that we've um, held since 2016. And it's a way for us to get to know uh, cultural producers and curators in the Asian American, American community uh, better and uh, it's really inspired by our tradition of oral histories here at MOCA um, and in that regard we're gonna really um, get into Michelle's life and her sort of um, approach to curating and kind of where that comes from uh, how much it has to do with her um, you know upbringing and uh, her um, sort of formative years so um, without further delay Michelle you and Maplethorpe um, are you ready? Okay, so um, Michelle, I want to start out by asking you about your early life, uh, where you were born, uh, where you grew up, and uh, maybe a little bit about how your family um, got there. Sure. So I, um, I was born in a suburb of Michigan and um, grew up there for my formative years. Uh, my parents were both from mainland China. My dad was from Shanghai originally, and my mother was from Guangzhou, and they both um, left early on in their lives, um, you know, due to the rise of communism. And my father went through Taipei, and my mom went through Hong Kong, and then, um, you know, spent, you know, each of them spent a 
a variable amount of time there and then both immigrated to the United States where um, they met in college in Michigan and that's how I ended up in Michigan. <laughs> um, but it's interesting. I mean, I think you and I were talking earlier, you know, before the program formally started just about how um, many of us Asian Americans and specifically Chinese Americans, you know, we've had such interesting and intricate family histories that maybe we were not always so aware of when we were younger. And so, you know, it's been interesting for me as I've been growing up to learn more about um, kind of the nuances of my parents' experience and then, you know, thinking about it in context to my own life and my own upbringing. And so it's been really, and, you know, now I have a six-year-old son myself. And so thinking about being a parent and, you know, informing his uh, growth and evolution um, is really interesting how, how that continuum plays on. So. Yeah, definitely. Um, I'm curious about, um, you know, your, your home life, how your parents uh, raised you. Did, you. did they talk much about, um, you know, their, their early lives? And then what was it like in the household? Did you feel it was, um, you know, did they try to instill a lot of quote unquote Chinese or Asian values in the house language wise or um, sure. culture wise? Yeah, I mean, I would say that where I grew up in Michigan, it was pretty homogenous. And so there wasn't um, a great uh, community of Chinese, you know, Asian Americans or even minorities for that matter, you know, whereas I think when I, you know, know of friends or colleagues that grew up in New York or in the Bay Area or other um, urban centers where there is a really deep community, um, you know, and rich kind of cultural um, relationship, you know, we didn't really have that so much. I mean, we did have some extended family that was around, but I definitely grew up very self-conscious, I think, of my ethnicity and of being different from other people, um, you know, and uh, my parents, they because, you know, because my mom was from Guangzhou and my dad was from Shanghai, they didn't speak, and they met in college, they spoke English to each other. So we spoke English at home. Um, and, you know, I think like many ABCs, I went to Chinese school every Saturday. And, um, you know, for me, I was a little Francophile, so I just wanted to learn French. And I didn't, I didn't really want to go to Chinese school. I was very resistant. And I think also because we didn't speak Chinese at home, many of the children who did go to Chinese school they were conversant, but they were there, you know, they didn't know how to read and write. And so I was kind of with the babies. And so I just felt like, oh, a little, like I felt like I was in this very kind of interesting third space where I wasn't mm -hmm. Chinese and I wasn't American either. Um, mm -hmm. But just in terms of, you know, asking how we grow up, um, you know, my parents were pretty traditional, although I think in relation to some of the other friends, you know, they were probably more moderate. Um, that being said, you know, we um, mostly ate Chinese food, you know, um, and, uh, you know, we celebrated all the Chinese holidays and, um, you know, my parents were very um, focused on education and, you know, I think like many ABC kids too, like we did every kind of activity possible probably <laughs> that you can think of, but, you know, I do feel very fortunate, even though my parents were not, um, their professions were not grounded in the arts. They had a deep appreciation um, for the arts. And so from an early age, you know, we took drawing lessons, we took music lessons, we went to see, you know, we went to museums, we went to go listen to classical music. Um, and so we were exposed to a very young age um, to the arts and to mm -hmm. literature. Um, and so I think, I think reading too, my mom was a huge reader and we would go to the library every week and just get like stacks of books. And so I think just um, being, you know, immersing myself in, in different worlds, I think opened up my mind in a very creative way um, that I think mm. served me well, uh, you know, in my adult life as a professional in the art field. Right, that's great. And I want to kind of return to that theme later on, but sure. I also want to uh, touch on food actually. That you touched on mm -hmm. that, you know, you ate Chinese food mostly, uh, but your mom's from Guang Guangzhou and dad is from Shanghai. So different food cultures there. Like, so what, how did that work in the house? You know, was there, um, did, did 
was it a sort of fusion of both cuisines or was it did one sort of dominate over the other? Yeah, I think it was a good balance. I mean, you know, we have to this day, our, you know, our family dumpling recipe, the jiaozi. So, mm. you know, from my dad's side, and I have very fond memories of, you know, we have a big extended family on my dad's side. Um, and so for every holiday, and my parents, they're both the oldest of um, their respective siblings. And so, and and they were much older than I think, you know, the their younger siblings. Um, so they were kind of the surrogate parents. So I remember such you know, I have such fond memories of having, you know, maybe like 30 people or 40 people at our house for holidays. And my mom, you know, we had such an open house and my mom would cook everything homemade. And so, you know, for Thanksgiving or for Christmas, it would be like this pastiche of, you know, like shifa noodles, <laughs> but then you'd have like a turkey and then, you know, like all <laughs> yeah. like kind of this uh, pastiche, but, you know, certainly, you know, Oh, so back to the jiaozi recipe. So, you know, I, re I remember that we, the family would come and we would spend the whole day like making the dough and wrapping mm. everything and eating them on the way and, you know, making scallion pancakes. And it was just such a mm. festive um, platform to bring everybody together. And mm. so I do think of food and family in that way as kind of this, mm. as food as a vehicle to really kind of bring people together and to, as a really social activity um through that right. experience right right um yeah it's interesting the, the, the thanksgiving thing is definitely you know um an occasion for a lot of experimentation right like a lot of uh... yeah definitely, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> so you talked about um sort of early uh exposure to museums and and, and other forms of uh culture with a capital A, with a capital C. Uh, yeah, could you talk about that? Like maybe um, a museum experience, like an early museum experience that sort of struck you, uh, maybe like a piece of art that kind of stayed with you. Mm -hmm. Sure, I mean, you know, we used to go to Detroit, the Detroit Institute of Arts quite often and they have a huge Nanjun Paik uh, mm. TV piece. And I do remember seeing that and just like, is that art? You know what I mean? Because they're, mm. they're using technology. And I think at that time, it really did kind of strike me as something that was, you know, not a painting or a traditional like figurative sculpture. And so it kind of, um, you know, whetted my curiosity uh, for that. Um, you know, when I was in middle school, after seventh grade, my family um, moved temporarily to Toronto. And so with that too, you know, being in a more urban center. And I think at that time when I lived there, it was in the late eighties. And so there was this great migration for a lot of families from Hong Kong um, because it was before the handover um, of Hong Kong back to mainland China. And so um, a lot of families were sending their children over and emigrating um, in advance of that. And so it was interesting to go kind of from this you know, suburban homogenous um, experience in Michigan to then being in this kind of very, um, you know, more robust community of, of mm. Asians um, during that period. And, and I think also too, just being in a more robust um, cultural center, you know, um, and so that I think even, um, more deeply whetted my appetite for the arts um, and for, for visual art in particular. And it was mm. during that time actually that I, um, I went to Cranbrook for high school, um, to boarding school. Um, so I was in uh, Toronto for eighth grade and ninth grade and my parents weren't so happy with the education system there. So they sent me to Cranbrook. And for those who are not familiar, Cranbrook is really kind of one of the preeminent art schools in the States. Um, they have a wonderful graduate school um, there and the high school and the, um, you know, the primary schools are also very, um, um, they have a great emphasis on the arts there. Mm -hmm. And so I think that again, you know, more deeply, um, ensconced and interest, you know, and I think it, it was during my time at Cranbrook that I really began focusing more seriously on making art and wanting to develop a career in the arts. Um, mm. so. Yeah, I wanted to, that's kind of what I wanted to ask next is just how did that, 
you know, happen, this, this kind of interest and exposure to art through going to museums and, you know, uh, going to concerts and then, and then how did that become this more concrete idea that this is what you wanted to do as a, mm-hmm. as maybe a career. And it sounds like it was through kind of art making and, and through like the Cranbrook experience. I'm curious what the, what the art making uh, was like back then. Were you painting? Were you sure. sculpting? Yeah, sculpting? I mean, I always loved to make things since I was little, you know, as I said, mm-hmm. we did so many different activities and um, I loved making things. And so I always kind of, I think there was always this duality in me of making things and then being more on the scholarly side of things. And Mm -hmm. so, um, you know, and that continued through high school and through college. And I would have to say through, you know, through to my earlier professional career. Um, So, you know, when I was early on, you know, making painting, sculpture, printmaking, those kinds of more kind of foundational arts, um, and actually when I was in high school, I did uh, get into art school. I got into San Francisco Art Institute. We, like my friends and I, we went to Portfolio Day and brought my portfolio and they accepted me. And I was so excited. I was like, oh, you know, my parents, you know, yeah. guess what? I got into school and like, they totally didn't take it seriously at all. And we're just like, okay, well, let's go. You know, and they, as I said, they were very academically minded. So, you know, it was all about, you know, going to definitely going to college, but wanting to go to Ivy League or just being very kind of prescriptive in where, what they want, how do they wanted me to focus my studies. Um, And so, you know, I think I had to go through a real process of trying to figure out um, how I wanted to navigate both my studies, but also then kind of embarking on what I wanted to do. Because I think while my parents were always supportive and open and encouraging us about experiencing art and and participating in artistic and creative activities and cultural activities, you know, they definitely saw it as um, as a sidebar, you know, wasn't supposed to be the core focus of your work or of of what you should be um, aspiring towards. Um, So that was a real struggle for me, you know, and I think during undergrad, because I wasn't focusing on the subjects maybe that my parents would have been, you know, uh, wanting me to focus on. Then I kind of, um, I, I ended up, you know, really going a little overboard. You know, it's like I <laughs> double majored in studio art and art history. And then like I had a minor in French and then added like a almost a major in English. And so it's like, I tried to make up in volume you know, even though I wasn't able to do it through the subject matter that they wanted me to focus on. Um, Right. So, yeah. So, uh, so it sounds like you had this tension between, you know, wanting to make art and and you said a more scholarly uh, approach to to art. So how did that play out? Um, You know, uh, how did that resolve itself, I guess? Um, I think it was more, I made subtle conscious, uh, maybe they were like, I made subtle decisions. Like for example, when I, when I was an undergrad, you know, I, I spent, I, I, I focused pretty equally on studio art and, and art history um, in terms of my focus. I mean, I also was a dancer for many years, like from when I was five Mm. until I graduated from college. So I was like totally ensconced in like going in some direction in the arts, you know? Um, but my junior year, I spent time in Paris and I studied art history then, but it was during my, um, summer internships in my undergrad that I started moving to New York or started living in New York Mm. and having internships in the art field. Um, and, uh, you know, when I graduated from undergrad, my parents, I went to Mount Holyoke, by the way, for undergrad. Um, and so when I graduated, my parents had moved to Shanghai for a couple of years for my dad's business. And, um, and it was an interesting experience because, you know, even though my father was from Shanghai originally, um, he came back, you know, he became, both my parents became American citizens and he went back to Shanghai um, as an American 
um, you know, working for uh, an American corporation, you know, in one of the early kind of multinational um, mergers with the Chinese government. And so, um, mm. you know, they came as foreigners, but they lived in a foreign compound. Um, mm. And so it was a really interesting experience then to kind of be in that dynamic, even though my father was Shanghainese and, you know, even though he and his parents left um, Shanghai for Taiwan, the majority of my grandmother's family, they all stayed in Shanghai. Um, and so he had relatives that were still there. And actually one of my great, my, my grandmother's sisters, the second sister, she lived in the original house that my father was born in. And, you know, each of the sisters had their own floor. And, and so we got to visit her and, you know, it was just interesting to see, you know, which was their family house. It was all chopped up with like 20 different families living there and then. And, um, but uh, so after I graduated, I was going to live with my parents for um, a year and kind of perfect my Chinese. Um, and so uh, I lived with them for a summer. And at that time, China was still very closed. It was in the mid 90s. And, um, you know, it was a very different time than it is now. And also, I think the fact that they were, you know, categorized as foreigners um, and my language wasn't you know fluent then it wasn't so easy to get around and I think also the fact that I hadn't lived home since I was 14 you know I was mm. just it felt very claustrophobic um so after the summer then I was like okay I think I'm done with that <laughs> so then I moved to New York and I I started um working in the art field and so uh, so back to your question in terms of like how did I kind of navigate between fine art and and art history. And so it really kind of was this ongoing back and forth, right? So when I first came to New York after I graduated from undergrad, I worked at a gallery and, and then I got a residency at Vermont Studio Center. And so I was doing this art, art residency there. And it was during that time that my cousin, who's actually in the art field as well, um, she told me that there was an internship um, in the painting and sculpture department at MoMA. So I was like, oh, well, I'll, I'll apply. And, and part of me was like, oh, yeah, I'll meet all the curators and show them my work and, you know, <laughs> get in that way, right. <laughs> which I did. I mean, I did end up showing them my, my paintings. Um, but <laughs> so, yeah, so that's, how, so that's how I ended up starting. Uh, that's how I started ending up working at MoMA. And um, I had a year long fellowship there in painting and sculpture and archives. And then I ended up staying there for um, nine years. Um, in the wow. and sculpture department. And, you know, it was during that time um, that I went back to graduate school and I had actually, you know, I was still on the fence and I was deciding between, you know, going to get an MFA and an MA and mm -hmm. um, I got accepted to both. Um, the MA was at Columbia and the MFA was at the Art Institute of Chicago. And, um, you know, it was a really hard decision, I have to say, hmm. but I, I think at that time, uh, I, you know, I, I ultimately made the decision to stay in New York. Um, I stayed working full time at MoMA and I went part time to Columbia. Um, and so, you know, I kind of made that decision and hmm. uh, kind hmm. of continued my curatorial track. Um, That's interesting. When you made that decision, uh, did you then also make a decision to stop making art or stop sort of pursuing it in the same way? No, I still continued actually. Mm -hmm. um, and even during that time, you know, I did a couple of commissions for people, but you know, it was always this internal struggle, I think, in terms of this creativity. And, and I think, you know, for me, because of that early installation of from my parents of, you know, thinking about art as something that is more super, super, um, super, it's more of a luxury rather than something that I think that you would, you know, that you should be focusing on. And, um, and so I think that the decision to focus on art history kind of allowed me to feel a little bit more like I was following my parents uh, mm. desire to be more academic and to um, to have more of a 
traditional career rather than kind of going totally off the chart to be an artist. Sure. Sure. Um, <laughs> so it's it sounds like you consciously, you know, um, kind of pointed yourself towards a curatorial um, career. Um, and back then, like, what did that sort of mean to you um, to, to be a curator and, and, you know, possibly working in, in one of New York's museums? Like, um, you know, how did you see that role at that time? Um, mm -hmm. Well, you know, I have to say, when I first started out, there were really no Asian role models that I had mm -hmm. to look towards. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, all in college for art history and even in graduate school, you know, all of the focus was on Western modern and contemporary art. I mean, I was interested in modern and contemporary art. Um, and uh, so even, you know, with contemporary, when you saw the IFA, their course listings, you know, didn't really go past 1970. Um, and so I think that it was, I had a certain idea of what a curator was. I mean, I think I feel very, you know, I was very fortunate because in my position at MoMA, I had the opportunity to be mentored by some of the greatest curators, you know, of the 20th century. Um, and so, and they were very generous. And so I really learned um, how to think critically and rigorously and just also thinking about the object and, and just, I mean, just across the board in terms of how to deal with blenders, how to put together an exhibition, you know, thinking about the objects, thinking about the collection um, and contextualizing um, the objects in a more um, socio-political context. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I have to say it was serendipitously Asia society that turned the trajectory of my career around um, because I was focused on modern and contemporary Western art. And it was the 1998 exhibition um, at Asia society um, that was also at PS1, um, Inside Out New Chinese Art that really changed the trajectory of my career and, um, and really passioned me to want to focus on at that time contemporary Chinese art which then brought it out to contemporary Asian art um, so yeah I mean it, that was such a transformative moment for me to see work that um, it was a totally different type of work that I had ever seen and I think just that personal relationship as an Asian you know as a Chinese American mm -hmm. to see others um, you know, creating work like that, that was so bold and so innovative and so unique um, and had such uh, a voice and a message I think was really empowering and I think really inspiring to me. Um, right. So that, yeah. Yeah, and I wanted to um, also ask about the, the sort of early days in New York, you know, you're working at MoMA, um, it's, what, probably the late 90s, <clears throat> early 2000s. Can you sort of give us a sense of um, kind of what life was like for you back then? Who was your social network? And, uh, you know, were you, were you going out and seeing shows and going to openings? And like, what was that life? What was that life like for you back then? Yeah, I mean, that was really exhilarating. I mean, I think it was everything that I wanted it to, you know, what I anticipated and thought that, living in New York was going to be like. I mean, you know, I would go to all the openings. I would go to the galleries every weekend, like every opportunity that I could go see art, I would go. I would go to, you know, program, you know, like the kind of conversation that we're having now, like going to all these different public programs, you know, visiting artist studios. You know, my partner, my husband is an artist and I met him very early on when I came to New York. And so like having so many artist friends and and traveling a lot, you know, and, and I used to travel so much to go see shows other places too. Um, and fortunately in my role at MoMA, I was able to serve as a courier and MoMA had a very um, expansive loan program. And so I was often able to take trips. Um, and so then when I was on these courier trips, like being able to see exhibitions other places. And so it was such a rich time 
Um, and I feel like, you know, I've been in the art field now professionally for just over 25 years, I would say. And, um, you know, it's the field has changed so much, I think, from yeah. when I first started to now. And I think just also in terms of curatorially speaking, you know, the mentors that I worked under, what their focus was and what their responsibilities were within a museum was very different to what it is now. Um, and unfortunately, I don't always think it's to the better. I mean, I think things are much more focused towards, um, you know, raising funds and and to cultivation rather than maybe thinking about the scholarship um, or the, the merits of an exhibition, um, which, you know, I think it is what it is. It, it's necessary, yeah. but I think sometimes it's unfortunate. Yeah, and actually I'm, I'm curious, you say that the um, art world has changed so much in the last 20, 25 years. And I agree, um, and I'm curious how you see that being, see that change, you know, what is, what is, what are the, some of the main differences between now and then? Well, I think one, you know, is definitely that shift in focus where things are more um, economically, you know, people are more economically minded in terms of both how they put exhibitions together, the types of work that they show for galleries. Also, I think because you know, in New York just specifically, but I think in many other places, you know, real estate is so expensive, just the relentless schedule of having to participate in art fairs like almost every month, which I don't understand how galleries are able to do that, um, you know, just both logistically and also financially, but just this, it, I feel like the art world kind of became this machine, you know, and, and I think the focus really got misaligned to what I really feel, you know, it should be. Um, yeah. Um, and now you're, you know, you're, you've been at the Asia Society for a few years now, but you have a new role. Could you talk about, um, you know, how you wound up at Asia Society in the first place? Sure. Um, so, yeah. And so, you know, when I mentioned how, um, influential the Inside Out exhibition was on my career. You know, I never imagined that I would end up working at Asia Society. <laughs> and so, you know, I, um, I stayed at MoMA for a number of years. And then, you know, when I finished graduate school, I, you know, I, re I really wanted to focus on contemporary Asian art. And at that time, MoMA really wasn't focusing on that so much. And so um, I, moved, um, you know, during my time, I, I became friendly with Tsai Gua Chung. Um, we had commissioned him to do a project, um, Transient Rainbow. And so he was looking for somebody to run his studio because the Guggenheim was um, going to do a mid-career retrospective of his work. And I was looking for a new situation and it, it really worked out so well. Um, so I, I managed his studio and, and worked on that retrospective. Um, but then, you know, and I thought too, you know, back to that idea of this duality between making art and, and being more of an art historian, you know, I thought, oh, maybe working with an artist, then I can also, you know, expand my artistic practice. But at the end of the day, you know, I think I really wanted to work with other artists and um, and wanted to to focus more expansively. And so, you know, I left the studio um, and, you know, Ty and I are still very friendly and I have the utmost respect for him. Um, and so then I did some teaching and then I um, ended up at Hunter. And it was while at, I was at Hunter that um, the director at that time, Melissa Chu, had invited me to come to Asia Society. So I started as a curator of modern and contemporary art. And I, it'll be nine years in August that I'll have been here. Wow. Um, and so I know time goes really fast. Right, and uh, and so I like just yesterday in. that it just seemed like <laughs> yesterday that uh, you know we, we we saw like Inside Out at Asia Society and then all twenty twenty one completely. So yeah, and so I I stepped into this new position at the end of October, and um, you know again I feel very fortunate to have had that 
long period of, you know, seven plus years, I guess, or um, so to, to really get a sense of the institution um, and to, to work deeply with the program and with the collection so that to, to transition into this new position, like having a strong institutional history, understanding the network, because we have 13 centers internationally um, as part of Asia Society. And so having, gaining a really intimate understanding of how the network works and um, building networks between, um, you know, art centers where we're based. Um, I think it allowed me to quite seamlessly step into this new role. And I think it gave me the knowledge and the foundation to be able to, um, you know, think about the vision forward um, mm -hmm. in, a, in a quite seamless way. Yeah, definitely. And uh, I don't want to sort of read your title because it's, it's so uh, kind of impressive. Uh, Vice President <laughs> for Global Artistic Programs and Director of the Society Museum in New York, um, as well as I think the co-artistic director of the uh, Asia Society uh, Triennial. Um, so, I mean, with that title, like, you know, how do you see your role or what's your, what's your vision of, um, you know, what you plan to do with, uh, uh, you know, with the programming um, at A Society and, and, and all its different, um, you know, satellites? Sure. I mean, I think across the board, no matter what, the program exhibition or initiative, I think, you know, what my goal is, is to impact young scholars and the general public in the way that I was impacted so deeply in visiting the Inside Out exhibition. I want the work that we do to impassion people in the way that I was touched. And I think that will be a measure of success for me. Um, I think that being said, I, you know, when Asia Society first started focusing on modern and contemporary art in the early 90s, they were really the first in the United States. So a lot of those early exhibitions like Inside Out, like Asia and America, like Traditions Tensions, those were you know, landmark exhibitions because they were the first. It was really the first time that people were introduced to those movements or those artists or those types of, of art practices. But you know, since then, and I think that's to the, to the good, you know, many more encyclopedic um, organizations have become interested in Asian art and thinking more globally. And so I think the challenge for Asia Society um, and my mandate is to really to figure out and to champion kind of how can we stay on the forefront of this field and what can we contribute that other organizations that may be, you know, more deeply endowed or bigger in terms of their um, human resources or, or their footprint, um, how can we make real change and uh, contribution that maybe some of those organizations are not able to do? Um, I think one area that we have been focusing on more recently that I'd like to continue is thinking about this idea of multiple modernities um, and thinking, you know, from moving away from this historical um, idea that, you know, the, the development of modernism was more linear and more Western um, concept. And so really thinking about, you know, artists who have been under recognized up until now and really kind of seeing how they um, influenced the evolution of what we see now as contemporary art from Asia. I think also looking at the diaspora is really important. Um, and certainly, especially in this moment of great xenophobia and discrimination against Asian Americans, really championing Asian American voices. Because I think as an Asian American woman myself, um, I think Asian Americans have had the tendency to fall through this crack, right? And particularly in the art world, I think, because there's this certain still kind of exoticism of of being an Asian or being from somewhere else, right? And so people are trying to say, okay, like we're focusing on this other place or this other culture, or this other community. But then you have people that are right here that have important contributions. And because they're not 
they don't necessarily fit into categories or people say, oh, well, you're not, you know, you're not Asian really, you're, and so they're, I think they're doubly marginalized and overlooked. And so I think being able to serve as um, a platform and a champion of those voices is really important um, because I think they're, you know, they're exponentially marginalized in, across the field. Oops, sorry, I was on mute. Um, I know, and I think going back to another earlier point about what's so different uh, from now to you know 20, 25 years ago is this idea of the margin, and uh, you know, I think where that line is 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 different. I think you know nowadays organizations like yours and and Mocha also, um, you know, there's a lot more attention on uh, culturally specific organizations and and artists of color um, and you know you're seeing how the story of modernism is being upended at even places like MoMA which you know I would not have expected you know in 1990s um, so uh, I just wanted to welcome any questions uh, out there from the audience uh, I did have one uh, earlier from Chris Ho our good friend Chris Ho who is um, uh, joined me previously for a careers and conversation talk. And he asked about um, your art making background and how it, how you think it influences your curatorial or administrative work uh, today. I think it's played a really significant role, especially in my work with contemporary artists, because I think it's one thing to have the theoretical background and expertise and kind of being able to think critically and, and conceptually. But I think when you're working with objects, um, there is a viscerality and a physicality to them. And I think, you know, when, you, um, when you're commissioning artists or when you're talking about their work um, and working with them to develop, you know, physical exhibitions, I think having an innate um, and really, you know, fundamental understanding of the materials yeah. is really, really important. Um, and it helps you to be able to work with the objects and work with the artists in a way that I don't think you can as successfully if you're just, um, you know, a, a true academic without that experience. Definitely. I think so too. And I think because you are an artist, like I think your connection to artists and your, the language you use with artists when you're talking to them, I think is uh, probably naturally more sensitive than if you didn't, you know, have that experience making stuff, you know. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And just, I think, pragmatically too, like knowing how a material will react or knowing how to use materials, like, you know, when you're installing things and it, I think there's a, a greater ease, you know. Um, I think, and I mentioned the work with Tsai Gua Chung specifically because I think even though that was a non-traditional path, you know, towards working as a curator, I think that was very important for me in my curatorial work as well with contemporary artists because understanding how contemporary artists work and how a studio works and looking at it from that other side, it really, um, provided me with a great sense of empathy and understanding of how to work with artists, especially when you're commissioning mm -hmm. projects or putting together monographic exhibitions or working with them. And so that really gave me a lot of sensitivity and greater understanding from their perspective. And so can allow me to be a more effective curator and um, kind of champion of their ideas and their work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, there's a question from Christine Choi, um, and I'm gonna um, read this. Uh, sure. um, it's a it's a kind of a doozy of a question, but um, see how you respond. So okay. Christine writes, "I was one of the trustees at Asia Society many years ago. After I was involved with um, the Asia Society, the question about how the Rockefeller family took art objects from Asia, quote, illegally, but the issues were never never addressed. Um, why is that?" And I don't know if this sounds like it was predates your time at Asia Society, um, but you know you could also talk maybe more generally about 
sort of how in museums you, that are either encyclopedic or or other collecting institutions, you know, just the mm -hmm. issue of how objects kind of sort of come to the museum and some of the tensions that are uh, sort of wrapped up in that. Sure. I mean, you know, I think the way that um, traditional objects in particular were acquired, you know, in the past um, is very different. You know, we're, as we become more knowledgeable and I think more of a global and empathetic community, our ideas of, um, you know, and certainly in this kind of post-colonial moment as well, our ideas about collecting and acquisitions has evolved, I think, to the better. But, you know, that being said, their practices were very different in the past. And I think, you know, for Asia society, we have um, embarked on a very extensive provenance research project. Um, and there have been instances where um, we've examined, uh, as many institutions have, um, works that may have a questionable history to them. Um, and we have, um, you know, we're dealing with that as many institutions are in terms of repatriation and kind of um, thinking about how collections um, have been developed and acquired. I mean, that being said, to that point, we have a biannual arts and museum summit. And so the next summit that we are hosting in conjunction with our Australia Center in November is looking at is issues relating to repatriation and decolon you know, post-colonialization um, and um, thinking about best museum practices. So Christine, if you'd like to join that summit, I'd be glad to share information and, you know, I would love to, I welcome your participation in that discussion. Um, yeah, thank you, Christine. And uh, thanks for that response, Michelle. I think it's a very relevant um, question. It's complicated, you know, yeah. I think it was a really different time. And, you know, I think perhaps sometimes even if the collector may not have you know, they may not have known that it was stolen or, you know, they might not have mm -hmm. actively asked, you know, but again, I think it was a really different moment. Um, and I do think that uh, many institutions as is Asia society are addressing these complex questions. I don't think it's a really easy black and white answer to, to kind of move forward. I think it's very nuanced and very complex. Right. And now I want to ask you about the the current exhibition, um, the Triennial Chapter Two. So the first one, it was great. Um, maybe could you talk about, you know, how this whole project came together, um, and uh, sort of how you see it fitting into the sort of constellation of, you know, other uh, exhibitions like it, other sort of global facing exhibitions like it. Sure. Um, you know, this exhibition or this this initiative was five years in the making um, and was conceived, um, you know, by my predecessor, Boon Hui Tan, who was the founding artistic director um, in his role as museum director and um, in, in close concert with myself. And, you know, I think it really falls within that idea that I was talking about earlier, like how can Asia society in this age continue to push the needle. And I think the idea for the triennial originally was for it to be a citywide initiative to be spread around, um, you know, Manhattan. You know, we had a bunch of site specific commissions slated for Governor's Island, um, Times Square, you know, the New York Historical Society and other venues. And so really kind of taking the work out of its context on kind of getting outside of Park Avenue um, and really kind of engaging audiences who may not be familiar with contemporary Asian art or Asia society for that matter. Um, and, you know, that it's something that I address in my essay for the catalog, uh, which will come out in May is like, there are so many triennials and biennials. It's like almost every town has one. So why have another? Mm -hmm. And I think the answer to that is really in line with our larger mission for the institution is, 
you know, to provide a meaningful and ongoing platform to champion Asian and Asian American voices that can amplify their work and to really kind of giving them, give them a meaningful opportunity to one, you know, cause half of the works are new commissions. So to really push them to create new work, to create work in a different context out of their, um, you know, um, immediate uh, cultural environment, um, to have them engage with others on a global platform. Um, and so those were some reasons, I mean, and particularly also, even at that time when we were organized, you know, in the early stages of organizing the exhibition, there, you could see the rise of xenophobia and nationalism that was happening. And so this idea and the, the title of the first edition, We Do Not Dream Alone, was really a response to that. It was meant as a counterpoint um, to that, to really kind of underscore our common humanity and, and to see how people, you know, using the lens of Asian contemporary art, you know, they may have cultural specificities, but there are these universalities that um, kind of underscore and that you can really make connections with um, mm. no matter who you are and where you're coming from. Right, and I also felt like the, if, if you didn't show these artists in New York, most of whom I've never, I had never heard of, but they seem like really significant artists in their, um, you know, in their home countries. Like no, mm -hmm. I thought like nobody else in this, um, no other institution in New York could have made that happen, could have, um, you know, uh, done the research, um, you know, committed the resources to bringing the work here and to commission new work. So um, yeah, definitely, uh, you know, like a really, really great exhibition for just exposing, exposing a lot of new artists to, to um, audiences that would otherwise never get a chance to see them. Thank you, um, I appreciate that. I want to ask um, another question around, around kind of the work you're doing now, um, just around the challenges uh, you're facing and maybe in general, like what you see are, you know, some of the biggest challenges to, uh, curatorial work in our, in our field, uh, you know, right now? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think, you know, funding is one of the biggest challenges I have to say. I don't think that there's any dearth of good ideas or, um, you know, of people who are very serious about, you know, the work that they do. But I do think that because the funding sources have become, uh, more sparse and and there's such competition among institutions for that same pot of money then I think the types of exhibitions that people are putting together um, you know as I were saying earlier and kind of the thematics or, or the artists that they're focusing on sometimes is too much focused on what you know the financial support will allow and I think that's a real problem and I hope that we can address that um, so, oh, I think you're muted, Herb. Sorry about that, sorry about that. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> I do have one final question, which is, uh, I wanted to ask it because I, I get asked this a lot and I never know quite how to answer. But um, what do you think makes for a good curator? Like what are, the, what are the skills? What's the sort of, I don't know, attitude or mentality that, you know, that you must have in order to, to make a good curator? I think you have to be really open and empathetic because I think if you're too rigid in your idea um, or ideologies, then you're really cutting yourself short. I mean, I think especially working with contemporary art I think being open really allows so many new possibilities and discoveries that can really enrich your practice and allow you to think about works and to be able to um, present them and kind of transpose those ideas or be able to serve as an ambassador, you know, through your scholarship, through the writing and through the presentation of the work um, much more eloquently and effectively so uh, that's what yeah. I would say to be very open and um, 
yeah. And just see as much as you can. Like, I think, you know, that was so important to me as a young curator and a young scholar, just being out there and seeing as much as you can and reading as much as you can and just being open. Um, and, and I think networks are really important too, because I think being, you know, hearing ideas from somebody or, you know, being introduced to an artist by somebody that really opens your horizons and, and gives lots of possibilities too. So. Right. Right. All right. Can I ask another question? I just want to pick your brain yeah, sure. a little bit. Of course, you can ask me whatever. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I'm curious about your sort of day-to-day, -day, you know, work. I think a lot of um, uh, a lot of people think a curator is out there. You know, maybe they're seeing a lot of shows, maybe they're traveling a lot, or they're spending a lot of time reading um, art history books. I mean, what is your can you give us like a sort of back scenes look sure. into I your, mean, your daily life? That's like my dream job, <laughs> right? I mean, I think the realities of curatorial work and I've, you know, it's a lot of work. I mean, you know, from my days, I usually wake up very early. I mean, it's not unusual for me to wake up at like 4.30 or 5 in the morning to start work. Um, you know, I do try to go out and see as much as I can, but I think oftentimes when you're working on exhibitions, a lot of it is like having meetings and corresponding and, you know, fundraising, writing grants, you know, doing a lot of that kind of cultivation work. Um, you know, I think, and I guess it's different in COVID times too, because I think, mm -hmm. you know, while there's a lot of meetings, if we want to talk about pre COVID times, you know, I do try to carve out time to read and to write and to, and to go out and see things. I mean, you really, I think, have to make that a priority. Otherwise your day gets so eaten up. Um, but oftentimes I am out in the evening. I mean, it's a really long day because I think, you know, you wake up early to kind of, that's when I do my writing and my focus work is really early before the day starts. And then the day is full of meetings and like kind of doing that administrative work. Um, and then in the evening, you know, going to openings or going to dinners, like mm -hmm. participating in programs and events. Um, and then, you know, till very late. And then, you know, trying to get as much travel as you can. I mean, in pre-COVID times when I was working on the triennial, mm -hmm. I was going to Asia like almost every month pretty wow. much, um, like every four to six weeks. I mean, and they were fast trips. Like sometimes I would go for like a day and a half just because wow. of like the sheer work or, you know, just because of what the, my, the needs of what I needed to do back in New York. Like I would just, you know, and so you, you become yeah. very focused and you just kind of do it. Pile through it. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, that, that being said, it's so rewarding and I feel extremely fortunate to be able to do what I feel passionate about and what I love and so it doesn't really feel like work a lot of the time because it is really such a true luxury and honor to be able to to work with artists and to be able to share their ideas and, and these amazing objects with, with people and to think and to write about you know what you're seeing and what you're talking about. So. Yeah I agreed I think we're, we're very lucky to be doing what we're doing. Um, so you've gamely answered all these questions very beautifully and, and openly. So I wanna thank you for that. Um, is there anything that we didn't cover you'd like to talk about for these last uh, moments? It was pretty comprehensive. I mean, you know, I, I really wanna thank you for giving me this opportunity. I think that it's so important, this program that you have to allow, um, you know, emerging artists and, and younger scholars to, to hear other people's experiences, because I think that's something that I really missed as a young professional and as a student to really have role models that I could look up to and see different ways of um, of navigating a career or, you know, how to go about things. And so I think this is such a wonderful service and, you know, resource that you're providing. And I just feel very honored to be a part of it. So thank you for including me today. <laughs> no, thank you, Michelle. I think, um, yeah, all the, 
emerging artists and young curators, I think they got a lot out of it. I definitely got a lot out of it and it was great to sort of hear um, about your early life and, and sort of the, the ways that it might connect to, you know, what you're doing now. And I think I'm really excited that you're, you have this lead role uh, at Age Society because I think it's like an incredible moment to be, you know, um, sort of planning into the future with your vision um, uh, about what's next with this great institution uh, in which I've seen many incredible shows. And so I'm just very excited for you. And, you know, big thanks for, for doing this today. Um, you. And, I, you know, that, that wraps it up. I wish we had more time, but, um, you know, I uh, just want to thank the audience, the, the ones remaining for tuning in. Um, and uh, we're going to do more of these um, this year. Probably next one will be in May. My colleague Andrew Rabata will uh, be leading that conversation. And Michelle, thanks again. Thank you Hope so much. You I welcome. Soon. Everybody. Yes, definitely. I welcome everybody to come to the Triennial. It's open until June 27th. Um, and we also have this fabulous uh, Asia Society at the Movies Initiative we just started. So mm. hope to see you either in person or virtually at Asia Society. So thanks again, Herb. I appreciate it. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Yep. See you soon. Bye. Bye. <laughs>